My name is Paul Fisher. I'm the uh, panel uh, moderator for this panel, which is, you can see, entitled GDPR and uh, privacy. Um, we're, we're on a fairly strict timetable, so I uh, won't go through who everyone is, but you can see it there, but I will introduce them as I ask them questions. So um, let's start with Nicola uh, from Kemp Little. Um, how do you see the growth of big data impacting on compliance and businesses' responsibility? And do we have a microphone? That would help. <laughs> there we go. You don't get this on Jerry Springer, do you? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, so, did you, uh, do you want me to repeat the question? Or, uh... um, so you were asking about the growth of big data and how it impacts on compliance and business responsibility. And I think um, data protection compliance and the new general data protection regulation, which will be applying in May 2018, are really hot issues for big data now. Um, the new law brings a whole extra host of um, considerations for people who are doing big data projects. And I think one of the first questions to ask is, um, does your project involve personal data? Are you processing personal data? Because unless you've answered that question, then the GDPR doesn't apply. You don't need to worry about it. And I think one of the changes that has come is the definition of personal data has broadened. So, for example, online identifiers and sort of pseudonymized information that doesn't necessarily have names and addresses associated with it can all be personal data. So, therefore, you need to consider the law and how it applies. Um, so, once you've, you've got personal data and you're thinking about the law, then you think about how you're going to comply with the law, and the key to that is complying with the data protection principles. Um, so, if you're a business and you're thinking about your projects and your big data, um, have you obtained consent to use the data? Um, have you explained the purposes for which you'll be using the data and how it's going to be processed and what the outcomes might be to the individuals concerned? Um, have you obtained the data from a third party? So you might need to think about the, the contracts, where that data is coming in from, whether there are intellectual property rights as well as personal data rights to consider. Um, and then finally, I think um, there are also... Um, you need to consider what your, your outputs are because until you kind of have an idea of what your outputs might be, you don't need to know what's coming in at the front end from a legal point of view. Um, so, have you got sufficient rights to do your, your analytics? And the GDPR being, brings uh, specific rules around profiling of people. So, you need to, to take that into account, I think, when you're doing some of these projects and what the impacts and um, considerations might be for those individuals and not just the interesting the results that might come out um, for, for your company. You need to be documenting all the different types of data and what you're using it for. And this is known as accountability under the GDPR. And it's quite a big change from the current laws in terms of the amount of, maybe not paperwork, but records that you need to have around your projects and, and understanding what you've got, where it is. And I think there are perhaps some other people on the panel who can help with all of that. Mm. And then I think, obviously, you know, this is something that perhaps is, is of interest uh, to the ICO, but there's now some real teeth to the regulation. And fines, with fines up to 20 million euros, these are the kinds of fines that uh, get bored sitting up and listening and paying attention to this law. Um, so I think just sort of um, to wrap up on, on a sort of high level look at that law, there's lots of questions that you need to be asking, really understanding your data, what's coming in, and then making sure you are telling people about it, explaining what's going on, and complying with those. Thanks, Nicola. And of course, it is huge, huge uh, legislation. Carl, can, um, can I just ask you quickly, to, because uh, Nicola mentioned that mm. you've got some teeth now. <laughs> does, does that actually translate in, in reality? Uh, I know that the GDPR, it's like 4% of turnover mm. or something. So what will happen to businesses that lose data, for example? Mm. Uh, well, there are um, increased powers for uh, regulators to take action against companies that, uh, that breach data protection principles, that lose large amounts of data, for, for example. Um, certainly, in those, the, the penalties are, uh, have increased um, in the GDPR. Uh, I think 
however, at the moment, I would say that really our emphasis uh, is really on um, helping organisations to prepare for the, the GDPR. And I think that the points that Nicola made really point to the importance of organisations that, that handle large amounts of personal data, which I guess is many of you, uh, the importance uh, for them of, of getting your house in order, uh, really, of understanding uh, what data you've got and what you're doing with it. Because for one thing, you will have to provide more information to people about your processing of the data. Uh, so you have to be more transparent and provide more detail ab about your processing. So you need to be um, really uh, auditing what you're doing now in order to prepare for that. So I, I think I would, at the moment, I would tend to put the emphasis on preparation for it rather than penalties further down the line. Okay, Guy, you've got something quickly there. Very quickly, uh, thank you, Carl. Just wanted to follow up on that, that point on transparency. I mean, I, I think that's such a, a, in so many ways, the GDPR is bringing that in, whether it's Note, mandatory notification of data breaches, um, changes to consent, meaning it must be freely given, privacy impact assessments, data recording. And I think in terms of why that matters, if we look earlier this week at Admiral and Facebook, so much of the, you know, the data that was collected about us 10 years ago will still be there 10 years from now. But the information that's extractable from that data will be very different as our analytics changes. I don't think we understand that very well. We don't really know what organizations are doing and can do with our data. And that's why I think transparency is key. And on their own, they don't necessarily have an incentive to do that. So that transparency aspect we see is, is really crucial to, to having that accountability as well. Thanks a lot. So just to follow up yes. on that, um, there's also a change around um, or an emphasis on um, not using data that's collected for one purpose and then repurposing it for another one. And I think that's key with the way you're saying that about social media data and suddenly it's being used to affect people's insurance premiums. That's a really big change for how people thought when they were posting these pictures of their fun night out it would actually be used. Well, it's quite extraordinary the level. I mean, now on Facebook, in my own experience, I've been shopping for something the night before. Then I get follow-up advertising suggesting I buy something else from them. And I don't actually understand how that's connected, but uh, it's, it's not good for my uh, bank balance, that's for sure. Um, let's, let's, um, we're, this data is, we really are talking about consumer data when we're talking about uh, privacy. Um, so Daniel, how in your experience are, are consumers reacting to data being, as I just alluded to, mixed up, you know, Facebook between Google and shopping channels? I mean, yeah. What, what should businesses be aware of when consumers maybe start complaining? <laughs> so, you know, th three quick things I would say. One is that, that people don't really understand all of this, as you said. Um, they are vaguely, they're more aware than they were a few years ago that lots of data about them is collected. When we used to do work on this four or five years ago, people didn't even really realize the extent of data that was collected about them. We would ask them, when did you last give some data to an organization? Oh, when I did my last benefit claim, or when I, you know, and you think, oh my goodness. <laughs> People just didn't realize. They're now vaguely aware that stuff is collected from them all the time, but they don't understand how it works. And that means that there's this sort of generalized worry that people have that what is going on with all this data that I give? Where is it going? What's happening to it? And if you ask people what are the worst things that a company can do, and you give them a list, uh, they'll pick out bad customer service and losing my data as the top, their, their equal top. But if you ask people without showing them a list, one, two, three percent will mention data loss. So it's a worry that it's a thing that people feel they should be worried about, but it's a very general worry because actually a lot of them haven't really experienced a problem. And the third thing I'd say is that context is absolutely crucial. So one of the things we see in our research when we go and talk to people and when we do surveys is this unease with context collapse. So as, as you mentioned, data is collected about me for one, one, one reason and I'm in a particular frame of mind. I may be accessing a public service or I'm using my customer loyalty card with a particular brand or whatever. And then suddenly there are these, there's talk about this big data stuff being used to link that together in ways that I don't really understand and I'm not sure how much of that is stored and kept because I don't really understand what a data set is, what anonymization really means. And I'm just very uncomfortable about all that, speaking on behalf of the public here. So I think there's, there are big questions here that, that the public's knowledge is a long way from the kinds of people in this room. Uh, they're vaguely aware that data is being collected, but they don't understand the power of that data potentially. Um, and therefore, there are big risks for them that they are not even aware of, I would say. Do they think there's advantages? Absolutely. So when you talk to people about specific examples of data science, they go through a two-stage process. First of all, they say, do I think this sounds vaguely sensible and like something that someone would want to do and that makes sense? So whether that's government or a private company or whatever. 
And if it passes that test, they will then say, well, hold on a minute, what are the risks and benefits? Uh, who's going to be in trouble if something goes wrong with this? What are the consequences for them? What's the recourse for them if something goes wrong? So really, one of the most striking things we find is that people want to, to sort of feel that the purpose that is being done for is okay before they'll think about the technicalities and the potential risks and benefits of the specific example. But then absolutely they can see huge benefits for all kinds of areas. And they particularly focus on public services and, and government and what government can do with data, but they also see that there are benefits to them as consumers as well. Carl, sorry to pass the microphone all the way down, but Carl, do you, has complaints to your office, have they increased? I mean, I don't know, quite understand how the Information Commission's office's mm. office works, but mm. can consumers make direct complaints to you? Or? Uh, they, they, they can and, and they do. We, we handle a very large number of, of complaints uh, from individuals uh, who uh, believe that um, organizations have not handled their personal data properly. Either they've, they've used, they've misused it, used it for an inappropriate purpose, or they've lost it, or they haven't provided it to them when uh, they've requested it, which is, of course, people's rights under the Data Protection Act. So we do have a, a large volume of requests. Um, however, um, I think when we're looking specifically at the big data space, um, People aren't necessarily complaining about the things which we're most concerned about under that heading of big data. Uh, the reason being that people don't know that it's going on um, because there, there is a lack of transparency and, as, as the previous speaker mentioned, uh, uh, a lack of understanding, a uh, lack of appreciation in, in many ways. So I, I think we, we, we're not necessarily seeing a lot of complaints about big data. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of unease, um, perhaps a lot of uncertainty about what organisations are doing with the data. But that doesn't mean that it's okay to carry on doing whatever you want to do with people's data. What it means is it's even more important for you to be looking at the sort of standards you're applying to the use of data. Um, you know, what sort of principles have, uh, are, are, you, are you working from when you're deciding um, what you're going to do with the data? Uh, so what sort of principles uh, were being consulted, for example, in the, the recent case that was referred to with the, the Admiral and, and Facebook data, I think is, is a case in point, really. Uh, and that's becoming um, an increasing import, increasingly important question for big data business. Thanks, thanks. Um, Steve, can I um, bring you in on this, actually, because you work for a business that is uh, very much involved in the actual storage of all this data, and it, you know, it's kind of where your future profits lie. But I know that <laughs> earlier we, we, we had an interesting discussion about how the importance of data management, and, and one of the reasons that companies get into trouble is because they don't know what data they even have. So. Can we look at a little explanation of how best practice data management should work? Sure. Um, so it's beyond just big data, it's data management, and obviously that part of that is the, you know, this falls into the, data, the big data um, area. The way we look at it, obviously it aligns nicely to what we go to market with, but the way, the way we, we look at it is in a number of, of, uh, of areas. One, and... and um, your name, sorry, uh, remind me. Carl. No. Nicola, Nicola, Bapon. Nicola um, espoused quite a few of the, the, the um, parts of the law, the, the, the uh, clauses in the law, which, which we need to be aware of, which our customers need to be aware of, um, about their um, employees' data, about their customers' data, and so on, and any other personal data they hold, or that comes across their path. So where that, that data turns up um, is in structured and unstructured data, and if you look at across all of, the, all of the data that a company holds, which is, in you know, the case of a large bank, 20, 30 petabytes of data, you need, to be, um, you need to be able to keep that available. So it needs to be highly available in technical terms. It needs, you need to be able to recover it when, when it all goes horribly wrong. It needs to be backed up, absolutely. Um, looking at it from a different point of view, that you need to know where it is. So if I, I say, you know, Nicholas says, I, I worked for this company for 10 years, and I'd like to know now what you hold about me. Can you actually go and find that data? So there's a whole area of information governance, information lifecycle that needs to be examined by our customers and by, by any company. Uh, every company has the problem, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good place to be doing business, I suppose, and, and that's good for everybody in the room. And, find, and, and So you need to be able to find the data, and then you need to be able to do something with it, <clears throat> take a an action with that data. So you may create fabulous policy, 
uh, as and you know driven by um, Carl's organisation and driven by your your internal um, policy makers, and you need to be able to surface information about your data, metadata about files, data on your databases, um, data about your your email, um, information about about who sent the email, what project mm. it was about, did it have any personal information in it. You need to be able to surface that, and you need to be able to join the two. You need to be able to join the policies with the actual files and put them in the appropriate place, or delete them if, it's, if, it's, if you're being asked to delete it. That's two areas. The third, when it comes to it, when I go to my, to, to my ex-employer, when I go to my insurance company and say, give me my data back, or show me my data in a, in a recognizable format, you've got to be able to actually find it within within a, 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 a set of you know, databases, data dumps, whatever it is. And you know, e-discovery e, e is, a, is a big big problem for that. Yeah. Again, you know, there's a, you know, a vast industry, um, particularly around legal firms, um, you know, if, help, if, helping companies. If I was to go to a business, say a bank, and yep. say, look, I don't want to be with you anymore. I, I've taken all my money out. I don't owe you anything. Um, can you now delete all the information you've ever held on me? How, could I do that? Would they be able to? So there's the legal question, of course, which is: yeah. Do you? Do you, uh, you may not have to because yeah. there are other legal um, legal hold in, in American terms. But you know, you, it, there are other reasons why you have to hold on to it. Uh, there's the you know, transactions in certain industries need to be mm. held for a certain amount of time. That has personal data attached to it. Exactly what is personal data is not for me to decide. Is it possible to do it? Yes. I think it is the answer, uh, but I think you need tools and systems to do that in a, in mm. a thank God, because it keeps us in business. Um, and I think, I always say this, you know, you could write a thesis on how do you prove that something's deleted. Um, our backup tool went berserk when they heard about GDPR, because how do you actually prove that, that every last tape has been deleted from, from, you know, been removed, or has, has Nicola's data been removed from... Uh, that tape in Iron Mountain. You know, yes, it's been removed from every backup that we can find, but has it actually been removed? And if it was to be restored, would it just reappear? Those are the questions which we're addressing as an organisation for our customers. And, and um, you know, it, it goes across backup, it goes across archive, and it, it, you know, the, the, uh, mm. so the answer is yes, you can. Yeah. But I think it's a it's the problem we've never had to deal with in IT yeah. because we're not old enough. Okay. Well, I'm going to try it. So, <laughs> Guy, um, a question we got here is: is is, is, is big uh, big data too intrusive, um, and how can how can we prevent organisations abusing our trust, assuming that well, we trust without even knowing that we're trusting? Yeah. I imagine this is a room full of data scientists, so I'll uh, be careful with the line. I think I think it can be, but it, it doesn't have to be. So. I should probably say I, I work for Privatar, which uh, develops um, privacy-preserving software. So um, I may be coming at it with a technology-solves-all uh, attitude, but I also think it does have a real place here. Um, so there's often this debate, data science, privacy, or innovation versus privacy, uh, sort of Zuckerberg with privacy is dead versus Max Schrems with we must stop um, Facebook using all our data for whatever it is. Um, and, and I think that there are some instances where there is a genuine tension. But in a lot of instances, certainly most of the ones we see, there really isn't. It's not a question of innovation or privacy. It's a question of innovation with privacy, responsible innovation, responsible data science. Um, and there are a whole range of tools and techniques which can be used um, to do that. And part of the problem is, is that uh, uh, one component of them, which is very useful and, and helpful, known as pseudonymization or tokenization or masking, has a number of names, has been around for, for, for a long time, has been associated with anonymization. And so the flaws in it often get seen as flaws in anonymization. But actually, things like k-anonymity and differential privacy can allow a much more concrete protection of information. And there's a whole gradation of methods which achieve outcomes in between those two. Um, so for me, it, it's not just about uh, can we protect our privacy with innovation. It's also can we protect our innovation from privacy. Um, I was in the Department of Health when care.data failed. And you saw there the, the aim was an incredibly noble aim. It was to turn the entire health records of the country into one research body that we could use. The, imagine if your control group was the entire population. You had a randomized control trial where your sample was everyone who took that drug or had that intervention. 
clearly fantastic opportunity for research which failed because of privacy concerns. And yet what we could see there is that what was concerning was people being able to be identified. And what was valuable was what people shared. And those two things can be separated. The utility of the data from the identifiability of the data. And that can be done with anonymization techniques. You can answer the question of, did this drug have this impact, without anyone ever being needed to be identified. Now, if you want to sell a product to a specific individual, there is going to be a trade-off. You're not going to be able to do that. But most research is not of that type. So uh, in a long way around, basically, I, I think it is a risk. A lot of the time, it doesn't need to be. Yes, this technology is very new. You know, a lot of the leading, uh, some important research we use is from December of last year. So it, it is nascent as a field in some ways. But uh, it's, it's a really valuable resource in, in this question. And, and of course, this show is all about using big data for, uh, for what of a better word, for, for good. Um, so if, if we lock everything down, we're not going to be able to do all the good stuff, which, like you just mentioned, uh, mapping health around the country, etc. So um, the, the, the next question, I think, is really, um, you know, what are the ethics of, of, of big data usage? I mean, we've talked a lot about legal, but does it... It's all right, you know, do, do companies need to go a lot further than just saying, well, we've met, we've met the GDPR, uh, and now we're going to do this? Are there any ethics Thank coming? Or, or? Um, well, there's, there's certainly evidence of, <coughs> excuse me, there's certainly evidence of uh, an increased um, interest in ethical approaches to uh, the use of data. And I think we're seeing that across the board. I think as, as big data is, is bedding down and it's becoming sort of business as usual in, in many sectors, I think we're, we're also seeing this growth of interest in developing ethical standards. And so um, you see uh, companies, um, individual companies uh, like uh, AMIA developing their principles of, of uh, uh, tact, as they call it, transparency, added value, control, trust. Um, and we're seeing also uh, at the level of industry bodies um, and at a governmental level, the um, uh, Parliamentary Committee on uh, science and Technology last year recommended that there should be a, a UK-wide Council of Ethics to look at how some of these issues play out within big data. Now, I think that's, that's an interesting uh, trend, um, certainly, uh, and it's one that uh, we, as, as the regulator for data protection, um, certainly welcome. Now, I think it's important to note that we're not a regulator of ethics. You know, we, we don't set ethical principles. It's really for organizations themselves or groups of organizations within industry bodies to, to, to set themselves standards and to abide by, by those standards. Um, and I think that's a very useful exercise. Uh, so uh, while we don't, we don't set those, we don't police them as such, we welcome it because Basically, following that sort of approach, you know, building trust, transparency, um, having that, that kind of clarity, um, also helps organisations to comply with, uh, currently with the Data Protection Act, and even more so with the GDPR when that comes in. Uh, because really the, the key, or one of the key principles uh, of data protection legislation is fairness. And fairness is about uh, transparency, it's about being transparent with the people whose data you, you're using. Um, it's about assessing the impact on those individuals. Um, and it's about what would they expect you to do with the data? What are their reasonable expectations? So those are the components of fairness. So we think that following these developing ethical standards can help organizations to meet that, that key requirement of data protection legislation. Thanks. Um, Nicola, um, GDPR was again mentioned. Um, there has been this small matter of Brexit um, that has happened recently, apparently. Um, GDPR, you the, yeah, you may have heard something about it. Um, GDPR was originally supposed to be an EU-wide uh, piece of legislation. How will it affect the UK, assuming we do leave the EU at some yeah. point? Well, <laughs> and, and obviously there was some slight doubt cast on, on how that process will sort of pan out yeah. yesterday. Um, but the government confirmed just this Monday that the UK will be implementing GDPR. It was due to come into... Well, it's in force now, but it was due to apply from the 18th of May 2018, which under any sort of reasonable estimate is a fair time before we actually would leave the EU. So we will have GDPR in its original form, definitely, for a time at least. But all the indications from the government seem to be that we will retain something that looks very, very much like the GDPR going forward. And I think um, 
you know, there are reasons that people didn't like certain EU laws, but data protection didn't seem to be, for the most part, one of them. And I think the importance of the digital economy on sharing data and the, all of those reasons mean that um, GDPR in some sort of UK version of it will be in force anyway. Steve, you, you raise an eyebrow just then. Uh, so not that at all, just in, in support of that. Maybe if, if, um, <coughs> thank you. In, in support of that, the uh, questions we get, most of the customers that, that I talk to, most of the organisations, the enterprises are global enterprises, if not large enterprises. Um, if you have customers that exist, that, that, that come from the EU or employees within the EU, you've got to comply anyway. So it's a moot point almost, but, uh, you know, absolutely. And I, I hope we would go for it. You know, GDPR should be seen as a positive thing, actually. You know, it's, it's consolidation, standardization. It's a, it's, it's a positive thing. It's, it's how do organizations good for, respond to for it. everyone and business it, as well. It, it's good for business as well. Yeah. Go ahead. Can I just make that even mooter, which is, uh, <laughs> is that just possible? to keep hammering, hammering into that GDPR will apply, um, which is that we need adequacy. So at the moment, there's about a dozen countries in the world who have adequacy with the EU. That arrangement won't change under GDPR, that for us to have a transfer of data, free transfer of data between countries, there has to be an adequacy decision. So if we're out of the EU, we need for, to have so many of our services work. We need a free flow of data between us and the EU, which means we must have adequate protection. And what that means is we have to have the same principles and the same ability to uphold them. And I think it's very unlikely that we would decide that we no longer wanted to have any Europeans have our data or have any of theirs, uh, them have any of ours. So um, on so many fronts, I, I don't see how we couldn't have something very like GDPR. Data knows no boundaries, after all. Yeah. Um, is there, uh, we have a, a little bit of time left. Any questions over here, sir? Um, is there a microphone in the audience? Ah, all right, we'll take this one, then you're, sorry. Yes. Um, so we are in the early stage of actually exploring GDPR. Uh, one other thing which we faced quite controversial is the industry has its own um, kind of regulations around AML for detection, which sometimes goes in contrast to GDPR. So where we have stored data, which is personal data uh, for some time in a, in a certain way. So how does GDPR regulation goes hand in hand with industry specific regulation? Very good, good question. Um, I think Nicola might be... Uh <laughs> so, I mean, I don't think this is a new problem, um, and certainly at the moment this is something that with various clients, um, particularly in regulated sectors, we deal with now. So you are balancing, as you say, um, for financial services requirements around AML and data protection. and. Um, there are um, exemptions in different parts of the Act that apply. So, for example, um, you are allowed to process data in order to comply with your legal obligations other than contracts. So, for example, to collect data and process it for AML purposes or in the gambling industry, then you have to collect certain information around um, sort of people's gaming and what have you. So, you know, you are allowed to do all of that uh, and still comply with data protection law. And that's what some of the information that you would give to people as part of your transparency requirements and, and fair processing as well. But yes, that, it, Thanks, it, it okay. does exist now. Let's just take the question over here if we can. Thanks very much for your question. Steve Mingo, Health Informatics Specialist, a proposition for the panel for a brief comment. I believe that the whole information governance issue is a generational one. We're seeing younger people releasing all sorts of information with any due concern. That's my proposition. Okay, young people couldn't care less about data privacy. Let's take the youngest person on the, I don't know who that is. <laughs> oh, it's um, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm than he looks. Young people. So I think we do see a different we do see different attitudes among young people. We do see them having kind of come to a different understanding of what social media and so on is for and a much more willingness to share that information. Now I don't necessarily think that that extends to therefore being comfortable with whatever happens to that data. Um, I think they still have very clear, or they, they, in their minds, they have a very clear understanding of what that data is going to be used for and assumptions about that. Um, they may be incorrect or they may be, you know, potentially misguided. Um, so I don't think we should assume just because they provide more data that they have different standards around what would actually happen to that data. One final point then from Carl. Yes. 
before we, um, we have to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Um, yes, I, I think the whole issue is, is uh, a lot more uh, nuanced, really, than is often suggested. I think it's too simplistic even to say that young people don't care what happens to their data, and, uh, whereas older people are, are more protective of it. There, there, are, there are lots of studies which actually show that um, it is more, more nuanced than that. People do have specific um, concerns which cut across generations and, and different groups. But I think also, even if people are... Uh, providing their data quite apparently quite willingly uh, in social media and, and in other contexts. There, there, there could be a lot of reasons behind that. I mean, it might be simply resignation that people think they have no choice um, and they have no control o over the process. Uh, and so uh, the, 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 that, that's all that they can do. Um, so is that a good basis for collecting people's data? Um, I think there's also evidence um, that people uh, provide false information, you know, deliberately provide false information. A study uh, last year suggested that 60% of UK adults are providing false information in online forms at some point, you know, some, uh, some particular detail which they're deliberately changing. So that suggests that you know, customers don't trust those organisations. Basically, they're lying to the organisation because they don't trust them. So that's not a very good basis uh, for building a good relationship with customers. I, I don't think we can make easy assumptions about, about people's attitudes to their personal data. OK, Guy, this really is a final comment, so please just, sum it just up in a, to, in, a, to in a Facebook style update. Praise GDPR in one small way, which is that it, there will be this change to consent, which is that it must be freely given. It'll be very interesting to see what happens to this question after that. If a service is bound uh, currently to all of your data being submitted, but that isn't required, as in the service could be provided without all of that data, that may not be allowed under GDPR um, because it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't constitute freely given. And if what that leads to is tiered consent, where you can choose what information you give for the level of service you get, that will give us a radically different view on actually what people think about that situation. Because now it's all or nothing. So we might say, oh, they say they care about data, but then they give it away. Well, if they feel that they can't live without Facebook, maybe that, mean, that doesn't mean that they don't care. And this tiered consent, if it comes about, will actually get, will show us whether that's the case or not. So I think that'll be really interesting to see, to sort of watch that space. Thanks, Guy. And thanks to all our panelists, Nicola, Guy, Daniel, Stephen, and Carl.